Welcome to episode 144 of The Numbers Game. I'm Jace and I'm joined with Nick and Marty. How are we going, fellas? Going well, thanks, Jace. I've cancelled all Christmas parties. I'm just at it, working. All the business owners are on the ground. They're stepping up, leading into 2024. Everyone's hitting the streets, doing it tough, but doing it well. So good to see. Good boy, Ensi. So I'm well. Nick, how are you? Mate, I'm good. Just saying lo- Just saying no, left, right and centre. No, uh, no. Can't make it. Can't make it. Uh, I'm thinking about Jace every time I say it. Jace, how are you going? Any no's being dished out? No, it feels like for every no you dish out, I must be next on their list of people to invite <laughs> to events and functions. They're just coming at me from all angles. And, you know, some I've doubled up on a couple where I've had to leave one halfway through to attend another. So just getting it all out of my system in 2023. So 2024 is going to be the year of no. But if you're, if you're leaving halfway through to attend another, that's an illness. We, we actually... Mm. We need an intervention. I've got a problem. We, we need an intervention. I mean, next year I've signed up to three marathons to try and get me to like focus on something different. So Same day or? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah, no. So I've, I've split them up a little bit. And I actually blame Greg for that because Greg was like, hey, do you want to do another marathon? And I keep saying yes. So actually, it's still the same problem. I've just got to just got to find a way to say no, whether it's a marathon invite or a party invite. So... Oh God! Well, you know, we're we're actually going to have to uh, work out in the next couple of episodes. Um, we we need to bring in our predictions for the following year, and we'll have to recap what our predictions were from uh, earlier this year. I think um, I think you might have thought uh, Elon would be in jail, and I thought the Bombers were going to win a final. So, yeah, safe yeah. to say, there's a few predictions that haven't gone our way this year. You were right on AI though, Jace. That uh, you made a big call on AI. I think I you uh, probably got it right. Yeah, it's been a year on. I did say that AI was going to be a lot of noise around AI in 2023. Um, and look, to be honest, I don't think it's even started yet. I think there's been a bit of a lull even that AI was hot and loud and maybe it's kind of bubbling back down a little bit at the moment. And I think it's going to go big and hard again in the near future. Jeez, I love it when you talk like that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, even, even, even with AI, Charlie was actually posting some things on eBay. Uh, he's trying to sell stuff. But they now have AI on the descriptions uh, to upgrade oh, wow. your, your listing. So Charlie goes, this is great. I could write four things about the product and it will give me an outstanding listing that's very relevant because I was watching it because I thought, what's he putting in compared to what's being spit out here? But it was it was actually fantastic. So talk about efficiencies. Uh, kids of uh, today going into adults into the future are going to have a whole different concept of what business is in regards to using AI and efficiencies with it. So I thought that was wow. pretty remarkable. Well, speaking of AI, and I don't want to go too early because it's in the works and being developed at the moment, but Dashboard Insights is uh, incorporating some pretty fancy AI into their tech. Um, and as our amazing show sponsor, I always kind of mention them up front for the start of an episode. So once again, I'm sure you'll, you know, you're probably not even sick of hearing about it because it's actually a really interesting tech program and software for business owners to get access to their data and run high-performing business businesses, Um, but AI will be built into the back end, help you increase your efficiency, reduce costs and improve productivity, profits and cash flow. So if you haven't checked it out, dashboardinsights.com and go and say, g'day to the team, say hi to Ryan and book yourself a demo to see what it's all about. On today's episode, Marty, you are due to bring us some wisdom, some nuggets of gold, and you've never failed to deliver. So I'm uh, very interested to see what you've got for Nick and I today. Well, you know, when challenging times are afoot, I always like to go to someone positive, someone that's practical, that could deal with reality effectively. And uh, that person for me is uh, Charlie Munger, who is uh, Warren Buffett's uh, right-hand man and mentor. And he just always gives some great insights when you need it most. And probably my background in being interested in Charlie Munger was probably being a bit more loose in my late 20s and early 30s and wanting to do the next best thing as quickly as possible. And, you know, some people people might do some bad things in their youth and turn to religion, right, instead of going to jail. I wasn't at that point, but I thought... He is someone that I can always come back to with practicality that when my mind goes wandering off into a thousand different ideas, it will bring me back to the one that actually counts. So I thought what I'd do today is I was reading a book called The Tao of um, of Charlie Munger, I should say, 
and um, and also listening to a few podcasts. And I wanted to take a few of those concepts out, nine of those concepts and quote, and just apply it to everyday life and getting uh, the feedback of uh, your good selves as well, Jason, Nick. And uh, yeah, and I think it'll be relevant to the audience given some of the challenges we're going through. So I'll start with number one, and this shifted my perspective on things, but the quote is, it's the strong swimmers who drown. And I just... When I read that, I thought, what does he mean by that? The strong swimmers that drown. And it's just purely being overconfident. And when you're when you're doing well in business, you just get overconfident. You want to take on the next thing. You want to spend on the next investment. And it's those good swimmers that probably go into uncharted territory that, um, that get into trouble. You know, they're faced with circumstances that come up and all of a sudden they're in strife. Whereas someone that can swim but is not a great swimmer will probably stay just that bit closer to the shore and make sure that they're playing in safer grounds. So he goes, a lot of the times those people that are innovative out there in businesses and are going, you know, to great heights to create something, some win, some win big, but what you forget about is often how many people have drowned along the way trying to get to where that one person who won got to. So I thought that was interesting. Good shift of perspective. I think you need to reach out and to strive, but how far, right? So thoughts? What do you think, guys? I can relate because um, you know, from a business that's had a lot of growth and I think you need to just check back in at times like this and make sure that you're, you know, st- to your point, staying in the shallow end, or um, you know, maybe staying staying where we where, where you, you know you can you can save yourself. The ship starts to go down. So, yeah, I think it's 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 strong advice for sure. Yeah, and and I'd agree. I think that that you know, strong swimmers. It's the strong swimmers who drown. Overconfidence can kill you. In that sentence, I I see in here, and from experience, I've seen business owners who have jumped into a totally different segment, a different category, bought a business in an area that they're not familiar with. And they've gone, well, if I can run that business over there, there's no reason why I can't apply that over here. And sometimes it doesn't translate and it doesn't kind of get copied across. And, you know, overconfidence can end up being a down downfall. And that's what Charlie and Warren were saying about the internet boom in 2000. Like everyone was jumping in trying to make a quick buck. It's the same with crypto. Um, they, they just stayed away from that. They looked at the good businesses that will be there for the next 10, 15 20 years and made sure they got them at a good price um, rather than trying to, they said, if it comes off, great, but we don't want to uh, burn our money that way. So that was just interesting thought process. Um, Number two, those who will not face improvements because there are changes to be made will face changes that are not improvements. And I think that's a bit more of a stock standard one in that if you're not willing to change habits in real time, um, you might find that things are changing around you and uh, you might not like some of those changes if you're not adapting in real time. And I, I take that in the context of the book, he was basically saying you've always got to be relevant in the game that you're playing. You're in your core competencies but you've got to be relevant and nimble. And that's why they don't like to do strategic forecasting because they're going, if you're focusing on a forecast, which which I thought was fascinating actually, they're saying you could be missing what's going on right here because you're so concentrating on what you want to accomplish on the forecast. So they said we'd rather be nimble where we're at, make the great decisions where we're at, in our core competencies. And that's how we're always going to get the best result to continue to involve our investments and businesses. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting. So, you know, you've got to be willing to make those changes in real time. And I'm sure you can all relate to that in in, in our businesses that, um, yeah, that you've had to make nimble adjustments given circumstances can change pretty quickly. Jase? Yeah, definitely. Look, business and even personally, I think about changing habits and, you know, good habits and bad habits. And as much as we joke about me saying yes to everything, that is definitely a habit that I need to change. You know, I need to improve in that area. Um, And if I don't, I'm going to break. I'm going to burn out. I'm going to end up, you know, hating and, you know, not being, you know, comfortable and happy and proud of the life and business that I've created because it's my choice. It's my choice to to say yes to things. It was my choice to grow the business to the size it is today. But if I keep on going about bad habits without making changes and improving, 
I'm not going to be around to to enjoy it. So that, that's a great point. That's exactly what he talks about, actually, Jace. He says you've got to make those little changes in real time. You could read all the books in the world, listen to all the podcasts in the world, but if you're not making those subtle changes, um, you're, you're really not evolving. So he likes to keep it very nimble as to what's happening in your life now and using your own intelligence and awareness to improve. And he goes, everyone makes mistakes. He goes, if you're not making mistakes, you're in total inactivity and you're not learning anything. He said, it's a part of life. He said, the real, the real crux to living is not making those same mistakes again and really mm -hmm. learning from them and, um, you know, not going into places where you could die, <laughs> you know. So it's uh, it's good that you bring that up. Like 161. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. I'll go to number three. Uh, it's pretty generic, but I liked it. Whenever you think something or some person is ruining your life, it's you. <laughs> A victimization mentality is so uh, debilitating. And that is so true a statement. Mm. If ever I find myself, and this is this has been really good, if ever I find myself bitching or widging about something, I always come back to going, it's me. It's me. And that just shifts your mentality straight away to something more productive because if you have to send everyone else to the psychologist for your life to be better, it's just not going to work. So I really like that one. Nick? I think particularly now, I think there's no... Um, it's 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 never been more prevalent that is that it is now. There's so many things going on externally to us, um, in, whether it's inside of our business life or personal, that we can't control at the moment. Um, so it's very easy to be a victim in 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 today's society compared to maybe you know ten twenty years ago. And I think a lot of people uh, just just take that that easy road and say oh, I'm the victim, but. Agree with you, mate. If you, you know, even if there is a level of, um, even if you are a victim to some degree, if you just have the mindset that you're not, you'll make the changes that you need to change. Um, you'll make the changes that you need to make. And I think it's important to mention that because, of course, at times you might be the victim or you might have, um, you might be on, you know, the, the, the wrong end of the stick, so to speak, but what are you doing about it? You can't control what other people are doing. You can only control what you're doing. So even if you are a victim, what are you doing about changing that? You know, I think that's important as well. Yeah, and even in this market, like you say, I've had a couple of people talk about the market and it is what it is. But like I've said to a few of the younger people in the office, keep contributing, keep adding value. You know, control what you can control and don't get complacent on what everyone else is doing in the market or talking about. At least you can control that and get the best out of that market regardless. So don't be the victim to it. It's, uh, that is really debilitating. Um, I really like number four, and uh, I'm sure you'll resonate with this and as our audience will. Some people seem to think there's no trouble just because it hasn't happened yet. If you jump out of the window at the 42nd floor and you're still doing fine as you pass the 27th floor, that doesn't mean you don't have a serious problem. I would want to address the problem right now. So to me, that comes back down to trends. When you can elicit a trend in a market and you need to make adjustments, you make it from when you acknowledge that there's a problem there and something has shifted. And that could be on the upward side too. You know, you could... You could ride that upside as well when you acknowledge that it's there. But I think that's great. So often, and this is like even changing people's budgets at home. How many people are going, oh, I still want to buy the coffee or I still want to go out for dinner even though I can't afford it, I probably have to sell one of the cars. You know, it's it's like, you know, don't, don't be caught on the back end of a serious problem when you can make adjustments to rectify right now, even if you don't like what you have to do necessarily, but do it because you know, you'll save yourself from a serious fall. I think that is really relevant in this, uh, in this market. Uh, any comments and feedback on that one? I think how many people would know there's problems brewing but wouldn't do anything about it um, in business and, and personal? So can definitely relate to that. Um, <laughs> I like the example. I really mm. like the example. I think it's extreme, like, but I, I it, like the example. It, de yeah. it definitely is extreme, but I think about like a stock that I've bought and as I've seen it going down and down and down, I've gone, oh, I'll just write it out. But if I'd sold halfway down, maybe I wouldn't have incurred the entire loss where the stock, I think one of them, 
I don't even know what it was. I, I thought it was going to be the next bloody A2 milk and put some money into, I think it was, it's now called Halo Foods. It was ketone dairy and, you know, the news was bad and it kept coming out and the stock price kept going down and there was thousands gone. But instead of recouping $1,000 at the end, I just, I just waited for the whole thing to be wiped off the market and sat there going, oh, maybe I should have taken action a little while ago when I saw the writing on the wall. So yeah, perfect, perfect sentence. Extreme, extreme version of it, but <laughs> I like it. You remember that stuff. How many people invested off the back of a couple of great years, you know, going mm. back in business? We did it. You know, everyone does it. And then the trend turns in the market. If you don't make those adjust adjustments to make sure the business is okay, you could come crashing down. Like if you don't pick that up early enough and you just think you're right it out, you know, you could be gone. And that's why I like the impact of that statement is like you don't want to hit the ground, you know, even when you're going past the 27th floor. Pretty cool. Uh, number five, I like uh, – Obviously, like them all because I picked nine of them. But uh, <laughs> you don't have to be brilliant. You only have to be a little wiser than other people on average for a long, long time. Um, always like that. Just a little point of difference that uh, you put out there in your life and the market. It's like you say, a 20-minute walk every day makes an impact. It uh, doesn't have to be a you know, half marathon every day. Mm. But they're the sort of things that you know can make a big difference. And there's this great little uh, scenario he talks about where the teacher asked the grade four kids, if you have nine sheep and one of the sheep jump over the fence, how many sheep are you left with? Now, pretty much all the class got it right, you know, except for one person, Tommy, you know, and Tommy, Tommy didn't get it right. And the teacher goes, Tommy, you don't understand basic maths. And Tommy, being a farmer's boy, said to the teacher, uh, miss, you don't understand sheep. <laughs> and <laughs> if one jumps, they all go, right? <laughs> Let's follow the leader. And it's like I, I love that in regards to having specialised knowledge in, in a context where they know something uh, that a lot of other investors know but don't actually execute or some of them don't know. It just takes a little bit of wisdom uh, doesn't have to take a lot to get a big difference out of life and in business as well. I like that a lot. And um, I read another another quote from Charlie, which is similar to that about being wiser than other people. And it's about the the over a longer period of time. And he said that he constantly sees people rise in life who are not the smartest and maybe sometimes not the most diligent, but they are learning machines they go to bed every night a little bit wiser than, than what they were when they woke up that morning. And he goes, it may not seem like a lot, but boy, does it help, particularly over a long period of time. So it's all about mm. those little one percenters every day. If you're picking up a little bit of knowledge or doing the one percenters, maybe the extra 5,000 steps, the extra 20 minute walk, the extra podcast, the extra book, or a couple of pages, but, you, but other people aren't doing that and you are you're going to continue just to peg ahead bit by bit. So um, on average, over a long period of time, you can make a big difference. Yeah. Someone said to me, life's all about the expansion of your awareness. You know, you don't know what you don't know, but if you learn something every day, you get a bit further. And it's, um, it's so true. So true. Uh, number six, the desire to get rich fast is pretty dangerous. And I think that links back to the, you know, the uh, strong swimmers drown. It's <laughs> like... Uh, how many people want to hit the jackpot within 12 months and we all go searching that? That's why we buy lotto tickets even though we have businesses. It, um, everyone wants to do it yesterday and uh, you know, patience with the right strategy over a long period of time wins and they know that it wins and it's like, and we actually know that it wins, but how human behaviour, right? Mm. It's just we want it now. Mm. <laughs> and what will we do to get that now? And, and that's how people burn themselves. So it's, um, yeah, it's a fascinating one. I'll follow that up with the, the one other one that I did look up while I was looking at your episode notes because it was really, I, I love it. And it, yours was the desire to get rich fast is pretty dangerous. And another one is the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's it's time in the market, time waiting, time letting that investment grow. Too many people, they look for the quick win, they get trigger happy, they buy and sell, you know, and they cash out the smaller gain, not not riding out the bigger picture over that longer period of time. So, 
you know, and I think the one thing that, that they've done well at Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway is, you know, time in the market, you know, and their investment strategy. They're not looking for the quick wins, get in, get out. They are looking for, you know, great companies building exceptional value over a long period of time to ret- mm. to get returns for their investors. So, yeah, love it. Well, you tap into number seven and eight, which is kind of kind of combined, but that's that's Munger's greatest lesson to Warren Buffett was it's better to buy a great company at a fair price than an average company at a great price because uh, Buffett's me- methodology was to find, you know, okay companies uh, that were undervalued, but once they reached intrinsic, intrinsic value, they were still vulnerable companies. So he generally... Um, would have to sell those companies then and retain the profits. So whereas Munger said, don't worry about that, buy, buy them, you know, buy great companies that are going to be around for 30 years that you never have to sell at a fair price. So when the, bar, when the market goes down, you know, buy them at a reasonable price and just hang on and let them do the work for you. And that was the shift in methodology that Buffett had learnt from Graham where he would find, you know, more vulnerable companies which he could make money on quickly and effectively, but then he'd have to offload them once he got the value out of those companies. So they just used that same methodology of finding value, but with those great companies that were just going to create 20% growth every year, 20 30% every year consistently that they would never sell. So it's, um, yeah, very clever. And it links into number eight, uh, which which I really love this, and this is again that patience game you're talking about, Jace. Yeah. If you're going to buy something which compounds for 30 years at 15% per annum, and you pay 35% tax at the very end of that investment after 30 years, the way it works out that after taxes you keep 13.3% per annum based on that methodology. In contrast, if you bought the same investment but had to pay taxes every year of 35% out of the 15% you earned, then your return uh, your return would only be 9.75% each year compounded. So the difference there is 3.5% in the two different strategies. And what 3.5% does to the numbers over a long holding period like 30 years is truly eye-opening. And so, of course, I've read that. So, of course, I had to go and do the numbers on that. Wouldn't be the numbers game without Marty throwing some numbers in. I love it. Correct. Well, I thought, you know, it seems like such a small difference right on the surface. But then I go, all right, if you put 100,000 in at 13.3% compounding growth over 30 years, that would equate to... $5,288,135. Now, if you put that $100,000 and compound it at 9.75% over 30 years, it would equate to $1,841,529. So it's nearly three times the value of being able to have that buy and hold strategy rather than making that win whenever the stock hit that value price they thought was fair and sell out of it and go into another stock. And not to mention, you've got to think about the overactivity of paying fees on those transactions mm. as well. So that would obviously, you know, that would you know, eat into that profit as well. There's nothing better than, than looking at 5.3 mil versus 1.8 mil. But who's got that patience? That's that that beauty of, you know, when if you were just to end that with going, oh, it's a 3.5% difference in your investment per year. Cool. But when when it's a a, a multi-million dollar difference in your wealth over 30 years, that's when you know like these are the kind of lessons that you got to be able to take on board and focus on and find a way to incorporate a bit of this into your life. Mm, it's so hard to stick to it though. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the it's, thing, Nick, isn't yeah. it? It's human behavior. We mm. all want to get yeah, everyone wants to get rich quick, right? Mm. It's mm. just the human behavior of wanting something now as opposed to having a simple, effective strategy that works for the long term that you, you know, you apply. And I thought, yeah, it's a it's a great lesson. And you know, the hundred grand sum I did strategically that people, you know, can find a hundred grand, right? And that's a pretty big uh upside if it's used effectively. And and that's why Berkshire doesn't pay out dividends because they don't want people to be taxed. They reinvest it in their own um, fund 
And um, and that's why a lot of high net va value investors go into Berkshire because they're not paying those transactional costs as well. Not to say that that's you know, the best investment out there, but that's how they do it, you know, in order to making sure they absorb those fees ultimately. Um, number nine, I really like this one. Show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And I thought this was a really important quote. And I remember reading this probably about five years ago. And it's very important to align management goals with employee incentives. I think that's really like a lot of times management will have goals and employees will have their own incentives. And if both don't know what the other's doing, then it could be misaligned. So the importance of alignment. And I use this methodology. I was consulting to an air conditioning firm back in 2018 and just ran through this methodology with the business owner. They would do one to one and a half jobs a day usually, and the crew would get paid by the hour. Uh, and the business owner certainly thought the team could do more than one and a half jobs a day. Usually each job took about five or six hours, but he just didn't know how to get more out of his team. Um, so we worked out that we adjusted the incentive to have a job no more than a four-hour time frame. And if the job was finished prior to the four hours, then that time was the employees because he worked out that they were motivated by getting time back in their day. So when he when he sort of surveyed each of the team members, it was only a small team, only a team of uh, four, four people plus the actual owner. So the incentive, so, so what happened was, what ended up happening was in the end, each job only took two to three hours that uh, instead of what was taking five or six, right? So now if they finish the two or three hour job, they could move on to the next job in the day. And then if they finish that in two or three hours time, then they could take the rest of the day off as well. So if they could do two jobs a day, he would give them the Friday afternoon off. So they'd only get one job on the Friday. So it really was quite fascinating that all of a sudden they found efficiencies you know, in their own team to be able to deliver at a whole different standard because of the benefit of getting time back in their day where they could leave early if they did a good job and then also they get the Friday afternoon off. Now, it was also on the proviso that they would get incentives if they got a nine uh, a score out of nine out of 10 plus, nine out of 10 at least on reviews from the client and on the workmanship of the job. So the MD would actually overlook at the end of the job and see the quality of what they've done and he would score it out of 10. So they'd have to get a nine out of 10 to be paid incentives and they'd also have to get a nine out of 10 uh, as feedback from the client as well on the job that was, was being done. So there was still a quality metric around the incentive and the fact that they were utilising less time to get the job done, the quality couldn't fall away. So that was really, really important as well. So, but talk about team spirit and efficiencies and people wanted to step up. Uh, he said, it's quite remarkable, uh, the difference. And on the old model, they were completing um, about five installs per week at eight grand per install which was probably 40, 40K of revenue per week. And over 48 weeks, they were turning over 1.9 mil per annum. So I say 48 weeks because they were taking holidays over Christmas. Now, once the new incentive were bought in, they were completing nine installs per week at eight grand on average per job. So this is ducted air conditioning, split systems. So, you know, they generally worked out anywhere between, you know, sort of five grand to 13 grand, but the average was about 8,000 per job. So over 42 weeks, it was 72 grand a week. Their revenue went up to 3,456 per annum. So there was a one, 1 1.5 million upside in regards to the new revenues that were created in this small business. Unbelievable. Now, he did pay out an additional 100 grand of incentives to the boys for the quality work and the result, and the client feedback was high. But what was interesting is in the second half 
of the year that they'd bought these incentives in, 88% of the work that they did was all uh, all valued at nine out of 10, and well, nine and above out of 10. So it was quite remarkable how the quality, and before that, he would have said, the managing director would have said, I reckon they would have been around 70%. So there was a massive upswing. And what did you think that that did to the business? They obviously um, won more business because of word of mouth was because the job was so good and the boys were really great at what they did. And it also meant they were so busy, they could up their pricing. So it gave him an option to be able to generate more revenue off the jobs that were being done because he had great, you know, great reviews on social media as well as internally word of mouth. Um, but also it gave him the opportunity to run another team if he wanted to. Now, he didn't want to. He was really happy with that level of turnover for a small business, like delighted. So the, he just loved it, loved it as it was. So the only thing he had to be concerned about was um, maybe having another person in the wings to bring in if someone left. But everyone was happy. Everyone was getting paid more. They were getting Friday Arvos off. They were knocking off at 3.30. They wanted to start earlier in the day because they were, you know, they were excited to do the job and get out of there. So, yeah, I just thought it's amazing how when you can align those incentives with your team uh, uh, into management, how what impact that can actually have on the bottom line as well. So, you know, show me the incentive and I'll show you the opportunity. So, yeah, so sorry to ramble on. It was a bit of a story there, but I thought it was That's just super a, valuable. a great insight how you can move the needle with – yeah, you know, a few key strategy pieces. It's yeah. incredible, and and to think you've got a live example um, is just mm. unbelievable. It's got it's got my mind ticking about our own business, and I think um, it also demonstrates the value of time over money. Um, and I think about particularly with younger people now, how much they value their time. We we talked about working from home and flexibility. You know, here's a here's a way to get more. You know, to get more of that one thing you can't buy, as um, as Warren Buffett is famous for saying, which is time. Get more time back. Um, I love it, but you would never think it would have that kind of um, impact and outcome. So that's that's just amazing. So I think it was earned time. Well, anyone yeah. that's got a similar business to that, and where it's all about getting jobs done and quotas and time, geez, I'd 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 I'd, I'd be thinking about putting something putting something inside my business like that in the next week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of manufacturing businesses and you know product-based uh, businesses that listen to the numbers game. So I thought that would be a really cool story to share uh, off of something I've seen you know in real time. So yeah, I think uh, we can all think about that in different ways in our businesses. But I think it's important. What is the driver of the team, and how does that align to what we want to accomplish as a group? Absolutely love that. Resonates hard and. Um starting to, to get more clients reach out to us and say, how do we structure an employee incentive program or what kind of rewards and bonuses? How do you structure it to drive the team? And yeah, that, that summary there is a perfect way of kind of showcasing how to align a business goals with employees to keep them incentivized and, and motivated. Um, you know, in all the talk about, you know, work from home and four day work weeks and all the things that are the trends in the news or whatever, this is just a really good business example of what it means to to be productive and drive great results that everybody gets a win you've got customers having great clean beautiful installations and good jobs you've got employees motivated to get to work have a good time at work deliver quality work and then go home and enjoy your friday arvo also then get a bonus and basically a performance bonus for kicking ass and getting lots of work done then you've got a profitable business that has more profit, paying more taxes, you know, contributing to the economy. And, you know, it's win-win-wins for everyone. Love it. I think the thing for me too was just, um, and what what the um, director said, was just how the team, because they were being, I guess, graded on the team result, how much more efficiently they worked together and how good morale was within the business. And if someone fell out of that, they would almost self-regulate because they're all on the line in regards to the result and, and the quality of the result. So it really made them 
better teammates and a better team as such in what they were doing. So um, even even the director was saying he was very surprised at the difference in just morale, attitude, enthusiasm and actual efficiencies, work efficiencies that they had found quite naturally based on the incentive, the overall quality and financial incentive. So that was a real, yeah, it was a real eye opener. Yeah, absolutely love it. The, uh, mate, Marty, anytime you bring Charlie Munger and uh, Warren Buffett to the table, I think we all come out of these episodes smarter than we were at the start, which ties in beautifully to uh Charlie's lessons on on learning. So, um, thank you for sharing, Marty. I think you know anytime we're just gonna have to. I think we might have to create a segment in a regular. You know, every season we need an episode like this where you just deliver absolute gold. Um, I know Nick and I look forward to it, as do our numbers game listeners. So, um, let us know what was your favourite of the nine quotes or lessons from Charlie and uh, Marty. Was your your young man called Charlie after Charlie Munger? Uh, he was named Charlie out of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but but Berkshire Hathaway was a textiles company, so you know the link the link is kind of there. But uh, no, he was definitely after Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. No, oh, beautiful. <laughs> well, as always, appreciate your support. As does Future Advisory and Innovate, who are, who are obviously still highly involved in supporting the numbers game, and as well as another thank you to Dashboard Insights, who I'm sure. They'll share this around to uh, their teams and their, their users because, mate, it's pure gold. And until next time, game over.